Hello there. Welcome back to Jedi Knights. I'm your moderator, Christian Buckley, joined once again, as always, by my Chewbacca, Mike Connors. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you gotta take that out or something. Cutting that. Uh, this is episode 21, so celebrate, because we can drink at the the seediest bars in the galaxy now. Yeah, what? Well, wretched have scum and villainy or something? For like sure. Home of Watto. Is it, though? Because isn't he from Mos Espa? And not most icely. Technically, I guess, yes. Also, he's from uh, Toydaria. Right? Troydarian. Yeah. Is it Troydarian or Toydarian? I think it's Troydarian. Tr- All right. Well, you just set the precedent. With, I have no idea. With that Watto impression because it's time for Star Wars. Star Wars. Our Mad Libs opening segment. Thank God I come up with the. Uh, the, the words beforehand yes <laughs> so mike filled out the uh the required words for this week yeah titled watto's junk shop you got to be really careful with this, uh, this impression <laughs> if you're eating in the outer rim <laughs> territories you need spare po- spare donuts for your space cigarette or other odds and water bottles the place to go is watto's junk shop here you can find everything from robots that jump like Mexican acting beans. Mexican was not Mike's word. That was in the Mad Lib. Okay, yeah, no, it's definitely not. Wow. (laughs) Mexican acting beans to replacement wires for your happy droid so it can run until it blows a microphone. Be careful what kind of money you put in your computer because Watho doesn't take Republic lights. You may have to barter with some sad that you own. That was an an adjective. Yeah. Sad that you own. The greedy and rich Watto would love to get his grimy eyes on the that's anything that's precious to you. And don't even think about using a Jedi mind trick on Watto. There, when he says something costs 10 bananas, you better pay up or he'll raise the price to 69 bananas. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad that you appreciate the impression, Mike. Yeah, it wasn't... um. It wasn't as offensive as I thought it was going to be, which is good. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think it was really offensive at all. I don't either. It's time for the show. Yeah. Uh, Newsweek is small but small but many. Small but small but small but large. <laughs> <laughs> you ever <laughs> you ever walk down the street and then you see like a group of dogs? Like it's like tiny dogs. Well, like, like, like a, a multiple dog walker, walking dogs. Oh, yeah, and they only have one size to dog. Yeah, they're all tiny dogs. Right. This, that's what this week's show is. It's a bunch of tiny little Pomeranians walking down the street with one leash. Okay. I don't really like Pomeranians, though. Ooh, that is a problem because my girlfriend has two of them, and they are the sweetest. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I, I'm more of a big dog person myself. I am, too, but those two turn me around on them. All right. I just think, like, chihuahuas specifically... Yeah, Chihuahuas, I'm like not so annoying. Not into. Enough dog talk. This is the dog podcast now. Yeah, it is. The dog, the dog cast. <laughs> Are you a fan of wrestling? Like WWE wrestling? WWE wrestling. No, but they, I did wrestle in high school. Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's a story. Is that a, yeah, <laughs> that is a story. <laughs> um, Did you ever, like, so growing up, did you ever watch WWE? No, I, I thought it was kind of dumb. Yeah, so I never did because my mom didn't want me to watch something that violent. <laughs> Is it really even that violent, though? It's like, it spawns kids to jump off of things, you know? Right. Okay. And kids are dumb, so they would follow suit. They would pull a John Cena and, like, break their neck or something. Try to, like, do wrestling moves on each other. And yes. Stuff. Okay. I guess I was never part of that. So my one of my friends actually got me into WWE in high school, and we're getting to Star Wars with this, trust me. Um, and it was an interesting time because, like, a lot of the wrestlers are, like, in their mid-20s right now, and they're not, like, the big names that you could associate with any wrestling thing, but uh, a lot of them are nerds. Okay. Specifically, Austin Creed, big gamer. I'm not I'm not familiar with who that okay. is. Okay. Uh, but a resident of Boston, the legit boss is her title. Cousin of Snoop Dogg. <laughs> who, who is this person? <laughs> Sasha Banks. <laughs> okay. Sasha Banks, the legit boss, is coming to the Star Wars universe. Actually cousin of Snoop Dogg? I'm like 95% sure. He sang her intro song at WrestleMania once. So, 
According to the Matt Men podcast and corroborated by Pro Wrestling Sheet, WWE superstar Sasha Banks has been recruited for season two of The Mandalorian. Interesting. Yeah. I don't even know who this person is. I can show you. you. She uh, has very colorful hair. Like, I've heard the name before. Um, Very, very colorful hair. She could fit in well in the Star Wars universe, I think. Okay. Very talented, very athletic. Oh, that's her in her WWE. Yes. Very strong. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, kind of Almost not news, but I figured it would be worth bringing up because casting is happening for Mando Season 2 currently. As we know, they're shooting. Yeah. Um, I wish I had, like, a better opinion on that. I just don't know who this person is. Yeah. I would assume that's a good thing. I mean, it's it's interesting because a lot of talent from WWE has been branching out into Hollywood over the past few years. The first major one, I'd say, was The Rock. Uh, Cena followed suit, and he's been getting, like, better roles, and he's, like, pretty good in comedy. Um, there's a handful of others that haven't been as successful. Uh, Dave Bautista is another one. He's been in oh, yeah. lots of films. Lots of Disney films. Yeah. We were going to see Dave Bautista in maybe, Star Wars. Maybe I wanted to see him play Darth Bane. <laughs> that would be cool, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think it's interesting bringing up uh, Sasha Banks in terms of The Mandalorian because Gina Carano, one of our favorite characters from season one, uh, was formerly a UFC fighter. Yeah, I, th- I think I did know that. Mm-hmm. I knew she, she's ripped anyway. Yeah. So, you so know, you got to get those guns somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just think it's cool, like bringing in um, professional athletes for roles in the Star Wars universe. Uh, you can, the easy thing would be to be like, oh, she's going to be some like brawler in a bar that he has to go visit in one episode or something. Well, that's what I was going to ask. What do you think she's going to be? Is she going to be like a Gina Carano kind of type? Like, bounty hunter mercenary i think that's the easy choice and the easy thing to associate uh based on what happened with gina carano and having the history of extreme sports well is she gonna come back i hope so you can't have two right like i mean you could maybe she's like her partner or something okay maybe she's like running missions for grief carga yeah grief carga right like a like another <laughs> the shock trooper right that's what yeah or just like is. Uh, an apprentice or something. Maybe she brings her in, try to get her into the world. Interesting. Uh, but regardless, the clock is ticking for Mando season two. Yeah. Did, did, have they started filming it yet? They've, it? they've been shooting since, I want to say, before season one came out. Okay. I think we've discussed this like three or times. Or like maybe mid-season one coming out, I think. Yeah. Because yeah. there was the Instagram post of um, uh, John Favreau and the Mando helmet saying shooting season two. Okay, so it's definitely they're they're definitely pretty far into it. When you yeah, when you shoot something like that, mm-hmm. I mean, like it's coming out this year. Yeah, my so expectation, based on like shooting schedules and just how I know TV works, uh, or any production really, they are probably gonna wrap shooting by May, and then from end of May to October post is post. Um, but yeah, exciting times. Yeah, it's very cool. Making progress on the Mandalorian front. We're making progress on another Disney Plus series as well. Yeah. I think I know this. Cassie and Andor. (laughs) I am beyond excited for this show. Yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, Diego Luna and Alan Tudyk playing Cassie and K2. Favorite part of Rogue One. Yeah. Far and away. it's, It's one thing that they're doing a Cassie and Andor show. It's another thing that they're doing a Cassie and Andor show, and they made sure that K2 is also. Yeah, that makes me real happy. Yeah. Uh, so they were, Diego Luna was doing an interview for the new season of Narcos, the Netflix show. Uh, he was talking to Entertainment Tonight. They asked him about the Cassian show, just to get see if he would have any sort of information on it. Because aside from like one update, I think we've talked about in the run of the show so far, there hasn't been much news on that front. Yeah, it just they've just announced that it's happening, right? That's basically it. Right, and I'm pretty sure Tony Gilroy came back to help with some of the scripts. But, yeah, in comparison to Mandalorian and Obi-Wan, there's, like, next to nothing about Cassian. Uh, so, a direct quote from the interview, Diego Luna said, It's happening. We're shooting this year. I know very little. I've read scripts, and I'm very excited. Then they also asked him about making a prequel. He said it's a different approach because of the beauty 
and it's how things happen. It's not just what happens. It's not the typical way of approaching a story. It's about how you think, how things happen, which in fact is the same thing that happened in Rogue One. Um, That's like a brain twister. I know. He, I think he was like stumbling a little bit, but basically the gist of it is he he's really excited about tackling another project where you know the ending and then you're telling the story of how it got there because as he compared to Rogue One, that's what Rogue One was. And knowing his ending, it's funny to be doing that again and like stepping further back. Yeah, I, I want to know like when exactly this is going to take place. I assume he... He says in the, in Rogue One that he's been in that fight since he was six years old, right? Mm-hmm. So he, like, like what fight is he talking about? This is this is the thing that gets me because he says he's been in the fight since he was six years old. This happens days before, right? So, so how old is he supposed to be in Rogue One? He looks like he's at least thirty, right? According to Google, via ScreenRant.com, he's twenty six in Rogue One. Okay, that makes sense then. Yeah, because so, it would be nineteen years after the end of yeah. Okay, so the the show, the only blurb about the show that I got out of this interview was that it takes place in the formative years of the Rebellion, which is an exciting thing to explore. Uh, the only other time that I have seen this explored, uh, again, I haven't seen Rebels yet, Star Wars The Force Unleashed, mm-hmm. the the main character, Starkiller, defected and helped create the... Um, Rebel Alliance. Dude, spoilers. That's a non-canon I game know, from like 20 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I know. But yeah, I think it's a it's a cool era to explore, and in a different way than we've seen in Rogue One and Solo, which are sort of in the same, like, shot. I Yeah, I think so far, like, we haven't seen much... We haven't seen Disney sort of expand their horizons in time periods in this universe that they mm-hmm. want to explore i think the closest that we've gotten to that so far not talking about the sequel trilogy because that's just like 30 years that's after. just 30 years after whatever yeah. happened but like is that time between Retur- Re- return of the jedi and the force awakens with the mandalorian yeah but other than that like it's just been the same yeah because like periods because like rogue one solo and even fallen order they kind of blend together in the time period they're in they all happen in the same 15-ish years. Yeah, but, like, at the same time, that time period, that's 20 years, you know? Like, that's a long time. Yeah. And definitely. I feel like most of the content we've seen explored there is just so skewed within, like, the latter half of that. I see. You know? Yeah. Well, are you talking about, like, like the, the, the direct lead-up to A New Hope? Kind of, yeah. Because I mean, like, maybe not. Take a few years. Yeah, maybe not directly with Han, because he is significantly younger in Solo than he is in uh, A New Hope. But that doesn't focus on, like, the the con the, like this the central conflict of Star Wars as much, right? Like but that just more focuses on him. Yeah, I, w- I was tying it to like, like it feels that way because it's Han. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And with Fallen Order, it's what five years after Order sixty six, right? It's supposed to be. So that's like on the opposite spectrum, but in my head it kind of blended in with the other ones. And even there, it's like Fallen Order is a really great story, but it doesn't, like you said with Solo, it doesn't really like touch on the state of the galaxy. It's more about this personal mission, which I enjoy, but the Cassian show is going to be getting in the weeds about like the rebellion. Yeah, I think is that's going to be really, really interesting to watch. Um I always wondered what it was like from the perspective of just like a re- regular person in the galaxy mm-hmm. when Order 66 happened. Yeah. Like people knew about that. Like the emperor, like the Senate still existed. Mm-hmm. Like he had to make his case essentially to the people as to why he was Has left me permanently scarred. <laughs> yeah, literally. Like, yeah. but I mean, like, how did the normal person react to that? And I think the Cassian show is going to be an interesting lens into that world definitely yeah i'm really curious to see i mean like within cassian's character from rogue one like we know he's kind of detached from the whole whimsical aspect of the universe from his perspective like it's very much just the conflict and the mission well something must have happened to him well honestly i think that might just be how he lived his life because if he's been in it since he was six that's the only thing he's ever known right you know like 
the mystical space wizards are like kind of like what Ray viewed them as of like, oh, they're a myth. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yeah, they kind of existed, but I was like six when they were <laughs> well, still that, kicking ass. That's true. The thing is, he, he, he might be young when Order 66 happens and stuff. Mm-hmm. S- seven, six years old, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I'm not really sure. Like, I guess uh, there was a lot of propaganda in the Star Wars universe leading up to that, that the Jedi were the cause of all this stuff happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know where I'm going with this, to be honest with you. Okay, well, yeah, I definitely think it's interesting. I'm curious to see, ha- like, where in his life this takes place. I could see, like, having flashbacks to sort of establish that throwaway line of I've been in this since I was six, you know? Yeah. Um, so you don't think it's going to be Cassie Andor as six years old? <laughs> de-aged de-aged Diego, Diego Luna. Luna no I think like the earliest they cut it off is like 20 right. because yeah. it's Diego Luna yeah he can like you can make him up to look a little young not six years old I don't even think you can make him look 18 I think like 20 is like the bare minimum you can do here really pushing the limit he looks older than 26 in Rogue One mm-hmm. yeah and I mean they could just like Explain it by the fact that he doesn't sleep or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Soldiers probably look tired, right? Spies probably look extra tired because they got to be lying all the time. And when you're a soldier spy? That's just double damage. Yeah. You're going to look 40 years old when you're 26. Absolutely. But shooting the summer, probably coming out next year. I'm excited. I'm in no rush for it. I just want it to be good. Me too. Uh, I... I well, this is an obvious thing to say, but yeah, this is coming before the Obi-Wan series. Yeah, for sure. Even though we've heard so much more about Obi-Wan, this just seems like it's more far along. I mean, this was announced before the Obi-Wan thing. Yeah, it was announced before... I think it was announced like a month or two after John Favreau Mandalorian came out. Like, just the news. Oh, like you're talking about the news of the Mandalorian. Yeah, like John Favreau is making a show about the... About it's called The Mandalorian. And then two months later, the news of this came out. Pretty sure. Interesting. So, uh, we do have some more developments on time periods that haven't been fully explored. Okay. As we covered recently, uh, the Marvel Comics series of Star Wars is uh, currently ongoing. It's on issue three. That comes out the day you're listening to this podcast. If you're listening to it, the day it comes out. It's covering the gap between Empire Strikes Back Return of the Jedi we got a cover reveal for issue number six, which okay. is coming out in May. Wait, there are, they haven't even released issue three yet. No, I thought it was so far behind. Because we talked about comics a little bit on the show. And every time we talk about it, at least when I, my perspective is like, oh, sounds cool, I want to read it. And then I see news about like, oh, issue five or issue eight. And I was like, oh, I'm super far behind. But apparently... That stuff's not even out yet. Yeah, I guess not. (laughs) So there's no pressure around me for catching up, but we have the cover for issue six, and there's an interesting thing on there. It's Luke Skywalker holding the lightsaber. But get this. It's not his blue one because he lost it at the end of Empire Strikes Back, Uh and apparently we're going to find out about that story through this comic. Right. It's not the green one, because he makes that very close to Return of the Jedi. In the deleted scene. Yep. So guess what color it is? Wait, can I I guess which color it is? Yeah. Yellow. Hell yeah, it's yellow. Are you serious? Yeah. Luke Skywalker is going to be wielding a yellow lightsaber in the Marvel Comics run of Star Wars. I saved it to my desktop where there it is. So do you think it's, like, actually his? I don't know. Oh, the hilt? The hilt looks extremely similar to... Is it the Guardian? Temple Jedi Temple Guards. Yeah, that's what I thought when I saw it because I knew they had the yellow lightsabers. Uh-huh. So I don't know if he's like doing an adventure and he goes to a, a Jedi Temple and he's like, "Oh, cool, this is mine now." What if he uses this in the interim? That's what I'm thinking. Like something happens to it. That's yeah, why we never see it. That's a hundred percent what I'm thinking. Interesting. Do you think he builds it? I don't know because it looks a lot like the Guardians. Yeah, that's the immediate thing that I realized and for viewers and listeners if you're not familiar the jedi temple guards uh we will see more of them in clone wars but yeah they all wield yellow lightsabers yeah um they're in rebels okay cool yeah they are yeah they are uh i just think that's a neat little thing because 
recently we were both like, we'd love to see more yellow sabers. <laughs> well, we we just got the biggest tease of all time. Yeah. Like the biggest tease of all time. Yeah, and I don't want to sound like a bandwagoner, you know, for the yellow white saber being cool because it's like in a movie now, but like I always thought the yellow white saber was cool. It's cool because it it, I feel like a lot of people forget that originally Luke's lightsaber was supposed to be yellow. Is that true? Yeah, but it just didn't show up well on film. And um, like in the Macquarie concept art, it's a yellow lightsaber. Oh, okay. And because of like Tatooine, sand, you, yeah, it's not going to look good. <laughs> the blue, honestly, like I'm happy that they went with the blue instead of the yellow. Yeah, the bl- like a yellow laser sword I don't think would be anywhere near as iconic no, as a blue. The blue one just stands out. Yeah, it's dope. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. Uh, but seeing a, another yellow lightsaber being brought into the spotlight, even if it is through a comic, which the reason I said that is because not many people read comics. Well, okay, it's interesting that they're, like, not to cut you off, but it's interesting that they're releasing the cover for the sixth issue in February. Mm-hmm. Like, do you think that they're, they purpose they must have purposefully released this one just to, like, stir up the pot and get some people talking about That's what I have to assume, because there are times where cover art for comics is released significantly ahead of time. Like, I think uh, we were talking about the entire run of the show before we recorded. I think one of the first episodes we talked about that Luke and Ben Solo back-to-back cover art for the Rise of Kylo run. Was it that long ago? It was a while ago, yeah. Wow. And that comic, that issue that we talked about, came out in December. Like, I think the week before the week of The Rise of Skywalker. It didn't. It did not. It came out in January. Oh, wow. So, yeah. They yeah. released it extra far ahead of time. Yeah, that was the second issue, I think. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't think that's, like, a abnormal for comics, but, yeah, maybe this is, like, teasing something. Maybe it, the reason it's this far ahead of time is I know because there's it, another story coming out soon. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, it. I know... It, it's probably not abnormal for comics. I don't claim to be like an expert on these things. Like I don't, I'm not either. I don't really read comics that much. Mm-hmm. Um, but like they had to have put this out just to get people talking about it. And it must have probably. some significance. Like it just looks too cool. Yeah. And it could like, totally not have any significance. And it's just yeah. to get attention on the comic, you know, Which is fine. yeah, for sure. I just think it's cool. Definitely. I, do you know how long this, series is supposed to run for this this like star wars run i'm not too sure i can check how long the other one ran yeah some like 24 issues or whatever probably i think like the way that they're doing it now it seems as though they're gonna finish off this arc with a similar if not the same amount of comics as between four and five Mm -hmm. and then just do it again between oh actually no that wouldn't make sense do you th- I was going to say that they're going to do it after six, but there's there's too much time. Okay, so to answer the number of issues, it looks like, according to Wikipedia, the Star Wars 2015 comic book series, which started the gap between four and five, uh, 75 issues plus annuals number one to four. So we have a, a decent amount That's a lot. to look to. Okay. Um, and I'm assuming, like, they, they're in no rush, you know, to fill this gap. But, yeah, this, back to what you were saying. This is a longer gap, too. It is. Yeah. So, I'm interested to see what approach they take. I think, do you think, like, if they wanted to pursue more stories with the characters we already know, do you think that this is the gap they fill it in for, like, Luke and the Skywalkers? Do you think they go here for this? And then for prequel era, they stick to the gap between three to four. I think, no, I think, I think we're going to get a similar amount of comics between five and six. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to get some other series that takes place after six. That's what I want. And I I think that's probably the right thing to assume because you have to also consider between five and six, there's no Han Solo and we know Disney loves Han Solo. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, like, this entire run of the comic is just not going to have Han in it. Yeah, but who needs them if we got a Solo 2 on the way, right? That's, That's your Han Solo content. Also, who needs them if we have a yellow lightsaber? Yeah. That who, makes up for it. Who cares? 
Uh, we know he's fine. Yeah. For a while. Yeah. He's chilling. Don't let him get. He's on don't, ice. Don't let him get too close to his son, though. No, 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 no. We do have uh, a little more to discuss, though, about reading material for Star Wars because yeah, I like uh, reading. Uh, there is a book coming out. The novelization of The Rise of Skywalker. And in this novelization, similar to from what I know of the novelization of Seven, there's extra content, cut content, the novel cut yeah, of Episode Nine. So I think it's, they did something similar. I mean, they did release novelizations for Episode Seven and Episode Eight. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure both of them had stuff in it that were yeah, in the movies. I was just familiar with the seven one. I don't know if eight had like significant stuff in there. Yeah, I know the seven. The, I know the seven. The seventh book. That sounds so weird to say it like that, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the seventh book had some stuff in there. Yeah, and I think like one of them was like, was it Kylo on the Falcon? Yep. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, those were those were also deleted, deleted scenes. scenes. Well, that's what people are thinking about this. Yeah. So there's an excerpt on StarWars.com. Of Kylo Ren on Mustafar at the beginning of the film, uh, we see him tearing through the forests. We see Vader's crumbled castle, which is the coolest thing from this for me, because I really liked seeing Vader's castle in Rogue One. Well, so you're saying we see it in the excerpt? Yeah, there's like he said, like, oh, the, I think the novelization said there's boulders lying around, but it's not boulders; it's the remnants of Darth Vader's castle. Interesting. Yeah, that's so cool. And then uh, a giant spider thing crawls out of the lake with oil on it that's on fire. <laughs> and uh, talks to Kylo Ren. He talks to him? Yeah, it's the Oracle, apparently. Oh. I don't know. Is there an Oracle I should know about in Star Wars? Is there one in Clone Wars? I feel like Clone Wars would have an Oracle. Dude, I don't know about any Oracle. That's super weird. Is this the oracle that predicted the chosen one? Is this the one that was like, uh, there will be a chosen one that brings balance to the force? I don't know. I, I don't, I really have no idea what the heck this thing is. Okay, so this giant spider talks to Kylo Ren. And is like, well, hey, you're looking for something, right? It reminds me of, um, God, what was the Harry Potter? Aragog? Yeah, Aragog. <laughs> yeah, it's kids going through a forest. Yeah. Kylo Ren's a kid. It's a kid going through a forest, finds a spider. It's like, hey, we're looking for this thing. And they're like... Not going to help you that much. Uh, here's something vague. Get out of here. Yeah. I don't understand, like, what sort of information could this, like, mystical spider give Kylo Ren that he doesn't already know or won't find out from Palpatine, like, three minutes later? Yeah, I, I so I think a lot of people realize that, and that's probably why I got cut. <laughs> yeah. Like, but I, I did skim. I read some of it. It kind of, like didn't interest me a super like a ton but it was like oh weird spider star wars space monster it sounds super silly yeah you know there was something interesting that i was reading today as well uh dominal gleason and the guy who played um allegiant general pride great name what is his name the actor yeah the actor not familiar i can check for you oh i don't i don't mean to make you do that but uh apparently they filmed a scene with kylo ren um on mustafar uh, not confirmed it was on Mustafar. They said that it was some forest planet with Kylo. Mm-hmm. That's the only forest in the movie. Uh, the two characters are in this scene from the book. Okay, so then, yeah. Also, Richard E. Grant. Richard E. Grant. Uh, but yeah, they're present in the way that uh, Pride and Hux are discussing back and forth about just like their opinions on Ren, and Hux is, gonna, is saying, like, oh, one day he'll answer to someone, and then Pride's like, he answers to no one. So it's just kind of like okay playing off their back and forth. So I mean, like I just heard that they did film. I don't know if it's that scene, but I yeah, assume if that, it's probably that scene. Yeah, because they don't go to um the other for the re, the resistance planet. Yeah, they don't go there. Yeah, so that's yeah. the only other forest I remember in that movie. Yeah, I so, will. Yeah, so yeah, I think you're right. It's the Mustafar thing, and if they're here, if that's the right thing, then they probably shot it. We might see a giant spider monster oh, in the next man. couple months. I hope not. <laughs> I, I hope the CG's not finished. Because you know how sometimes you see deleted scenes and it's like, oh, we decided to cut this like halfway through rendering it. Yeah, and it's like like the whatever it is, like moves and like blocks. Yeah, like. it's like just it's just like just the colored polygons, there's no like texture on it. Yeah, it looks so bad. Uh but yeah, maybe look forward to that. I'm like interested to see what other weird stuff is in this novelization. Yeah, I'm. I, 
with all the Palpatine stuff, I'm really curious. Right. I'm I'm wondering if it will like give more answers onto like the burning questions that we have, most notably, how is Palpatine alive? Yeah. Um I'm also really curious to see if any of what we have heard rumblings about of how the original ending was fairly different. Oh, right. From what we ended up getting. I would doubt that. I also doubt it. But like if this rem, like if Kyle, if Ben Solo gets like three more lines in this book than he did in the movie, he will. (laughs) I will probably buy it then. All right. So I, (laughs) it's funny because like what if, there are a lot of rumors that they changed the ending at like the last minute mm-hmm. and there's a lot of evidence to support that. I would say the main thing is the fact that the, the Kylo's hair falls in the wrong direction. Yeah. I think that's the most thing of like evidence, evidence. That's what I'm, that's mostly what I'm talking okay. about. But like, that's pretty concrete though. Like it's that, something, that's something, something happened. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but, but it also just like the ending just feels so discombobulated that, that they're, feels like there was some stitching going on yeah um and i'm sure that whoever wrote this book probably wrote it the original way and then like had to edit it as well yeah (laughs) got a call from like mickey mouse (laughs) saying like yo you gotta change the ending to that book maybe so we'll see what happens there uh if you don't want to read that i'm sure there's going to be a long list of the the craziest differences from the movie available online within a day that's probably what i'll read (laughs) Uh, there's one last thing, can, talking about reading. This is a literature-heavy episode. I want to bring up a new segment for the show. Okay. That will potentially be returning in the future. Potentially. When it fits. Called Force of Our Wills. Wills as in W-H-I-L-L-S? Sure thing. Oh, I guess it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I considered it, and then I forgot how to spell it, so then I just spelled it as Wills. Okay. Like, our will is uh, strong. Because... Within a week, we said more yellow lightsabers, and now we get a yellow lightsaber from Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. So clearly, our desires have some sort of cosmic thing going. Yeah, what do we want to see next week, Christian? <laughs> Funny enough, next week is the reveal of Project Luminous. Which day is that again? Monday, the day we record this show. Right. So, um, ooh, so d- oh, okay. This is our last chance before we know what this is predictions predictions or hopes what's the biggest like ideal scenario for you all right what do we get out of project luminous take into account that the most recent report is saying it's a publishing thing only so no movies or tv shows or games it's books and comics so if that is the case maybe start there if we want to get like pie in the sky dream we can talk a movie or a game or something too, but like ideally, what do you want? I want to see something set in a completely different time period, something that we've never explored before in the current kin. I think it would be interesting if we did something with the old Republic. I think it's more likely that we get something with what is the high Republic. Yes, but what is it you want the most? What is it that I want the most? Yes. Something that has to do with the old Republic and the old Jedi Sith Wars. Okay. That is something that I would like to see. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we, we've discussed that it's o- it only only a publishing effort. So I would Potentially. Think, allegedly. Allegedly. So with those constraints, mm-hmm. I think it would be cool to have like two comics and like a book to start it off. Okay. And then, um, depending on the characters, those stories introduce, mm-hmm. maybe in the future. We get an adaptation. We get we get some spinoffs okay. here and there, adaptations. That's what I would like to see. So, if we're taking this Project Luminous thing in your direction, it's going to be the Old Republic. Let's say the book. Because I feel like the book would be the main effort here. Because, you know, the comics are their own thing, but the book, I feel like, is what a lot of people look to for canon. Right. Yeah, I feel like there will be more than one book. Yeah. This first book in the Old Republic, in the New Era Old Republic, Uh what do you want that lens to be? Do you want it to be from the Jedi perspective, the Sith perspective, an average everyday person in this galaxy? 
Uh, man, that's a really hard question mm -hmm. because like my first inclination would, would be like, it would be so interesting to see the Jedi Sith Wars from the perspective of like somebody who's not force sensitive, but mm -hmm. extremely ingrained in all of that. So are you thinking maybe like a trooper? I'm thinking maybe or a uh, general. I don't know because maybe like a hired gun. Okay. A mercenary. I know it's kind of like super cliche in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, at this one we're gonna get to it later in the uh the second half of the show, but like I kind of feel bad for wanting the directions I want from Star Wars now because it's just all Mandalorian vibes. Yeah, well, I mean, it's. I think it would be cool, though, because if you had that sort of character, they're not, they don't have an allegiance to one side or the other. Yeah. So you could see some fun backstabbing, and it would be a good narrative way to show the Sith and the Jedi. Definitely. Through the eyes of just one person. Mm -hmm. Heroes on both sides. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Uh, for me, on it, like ever since the the concept of the higher public came up, it's interested me. Yeah, definitely. And I would almost prefer that to the old republic at this point. I think we're still too close to the old republic as far as the place it holds in people's hearts to like rewrite it. You get where I'm coming from? Yeah, I guess so. Because like, what happens if? This is a publishing effort. It's the Old Republic. And then Revan is nowhere in sight. Like, people are going to be mad. I think what they should do is they should just, like, make an exception. For the Old Republic? No, and just, well, no, make an exception for Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2. Okay. And just canon. Make those canon. Well, there's rumblings that the first game is getting a remake. Good. So... If that is the case, I could totally see them rework it to fit in the canon through that remake of like, okay, there's this side quest that didn't really work out with the direction we took this character in the saga. So wipe that, substitute it with a new new character, new side quest. So like m more of a re-envisioning, I guess, than a remake. But again, that's just another big rumor. But I do think when we do get the Old Republic explored again because there have been seeds through, like, the Clone Wars. I'm sure they, they will do it. I, I think Revan will return. I think Bane will return. I just think, personally, it's still a little too recent for them to avoid as much of the backlash as they could. Okay. I, I think that if they were to do that, mm -hmm. I don't want them going and trying to find a new way to introduce Revan. I, so you mean if they re, if this is an initiative about the Old Republic, you wouldn't want them to be like, oh, Revan was a moisture farmer now. Yeah, like, I'm okay. not into that. No, I no, think, no. I think what they should do is just, like, I, I honestly, like, wouldn't want to see anything new come from Revan. I just want him to retroactively become canon. Okay. Like, I wouldn't, I, I'm not interested in that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to see something, I want to see where they take it. I want to see where Disney takes, if this, if they go back to the old republic i want to see their their vision of that i don't want them to feel constrained by like what happened in the past and like the characters of the past mm -hmm. though i think revan is one of the coolest star wars characters yeah it's it's a at the time it was like a groundbreaking character right i don't think they should mess with that i think they should just make it retroactively canon mm -hmm. and just move on from that okay. satisfy people in that way if mm -hmm. they're going to remake the game don't change any of the story just make it look really cool people will still buy it <laughs> yeah i just know that where it stands currently they're like super anal about what works in this universe and what does not i know but there's nothing <laughs> over there though they could just make that canon it doesn't matter yeah um i i would definitely be interested to see their take on it and i hope it's within the next decade you know um but i do think a nice like in between for getting far enough removed and still being entirely new territory is this higher public thing. So I am hoping it's the higher public because there's, and I'm saying it because there's always a chance that it's just more sequel stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do agree with you. I think the concept of the higher public is super interesting mm -hmm. and I think it's likely that that's what we're going to get. Yeah, I would hope so because 
especially revisiting the Clone Wars and through the show, I think finding a new appreciation for the political arc of Star Wars. Oh, yeah. I'd be super into seeing sort of not like an analog to remake the prequels, but like you have the Senate, you have Coruscant, and you have whatever political scheme is going on there. And then you have what I'm assuming is going to be the focus point of the higher public, which was what we discussed before of exploring the unknown regions. I think that's a nice solid in between of like what makes Star Wars Star Wars from the most popular eras. Yeah. I think the High Republic stuff though it's going to be tough for them because at that point like there aren't the Sith. Yeah. Like there's so if it's 500 years before that would be Plagueis, right? Cuz Palpatine is not born yet. Well, Plagueis was Palpatine's master. Right, but I'm assuming Plagueis had a very long life if he was able to cheat death. I don't know. I really don't know the answer to yeah. that question. I'm pretty sure that, like, he wasn't around back then. Mm-hmm. So, the higher public could be cool. I, I do like your idea of taking the approach from someone who's sort of on the outside. So, like, kind of the Palpatine perspective of the prequels of, like, I got my finger in the the Jedi pool and the Sith pool, so whatever the antagonist of the High Republic could be, I think it'd be interesting to see it from, like you said, a mercenary, or um, I think a trooper could be cool too. I want like a central anti-hero. Yeah, I, I think it, yeah, I think we could probably see that in a certain direction. <laughs> yeah, through whatever era we get, uh, quickly. What's the one thing that would disappoint you about this initiative? If it has to do with a character that we already know. I agree. I am very interested, as we've said before, to see the story continue in ways that was teased and left off at the end of Nine for a handful of characters. But I don't need that right now. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see that. I want to see something new. Yeah, and I, I hopefully that's what this is. And by the time we get episode 22, we'll know exactly what it is, and that's going to be the entire episode. Yeah, that should be the same day. Yeah, It is. So, that wraps it for news. When we come back, the Clone Wars continued. Uh, we're getting dangerously close to season seven of Clone Wars. I know. Well, that's the thing. Like The day after this comes out is the... At midnight will be the premiere of season seven. And how many episodes are there? I believe it is 12. Okay, so 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So. Honestly, it's probably better that we're just waiting to watch it. Because we could just watch it all at once. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm enjoying that. Yeah. So, I'm uh, going to take a short break. When we come back, Clone Wars time. This is where the fun begins. Welcome back. We're continuing our watch along of The Clone Wars the acclaimed series. <laughs> Why do you say that? You say that every time, I'm pretty sure. Because it, it deserves it. <laughs> yeah, it is acclaimed. Now it's officially acclaimed. Last week we were like, oh, now it's acclaimed. It is riding that acclaimed yeah, wave now. It, it's, it's, uh, I'm like kind of, aren't you a little like upset that you hadn't watched this earlier? <laughs> yeah, like I feel bad, but like I was in it for a while. I just fell off of it. Yeah, that's true. Because I, I remember... Like, 10-year-old Christian was really into it. Yeah, I loved the movie. I We saw we talked about it. I loved the movie. 22-year-old uh, me loved the movie. Oh, I was talking when I was, like, 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I'm talking about me now, baby. Um, but, yeah, season one I remembered watching, and then season two I remembered the beginnings of. But, like, now we're in the weeds. Yeah, we're really in it now. Uh, I think this is probably around when I stopped watching the show, actually. So you've really just picked up where you left off? Kind of. And I love this arc. The first one. The first one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. Uh, the first arc is dealing with the Mandalorians. The world of Mandalore. And I think I think the title for the first episode kind of summarizes this arc pretty well. The Mandalore plot. Yeah. Uh, season two, episode twelve. Uh, what do you think of this one? What was it what was your impression of seeing Mandalore? Was it what you expect it to look like? I've seen Star Wars Rebels in the past. Okay. So take it for, for with a grain of salt. This wasn't like my first introduction to Mandalore. Um, so 
I think in Star Wars Rebels, by that point, Mandalore is a little bit different. Yeah, isn't there like a little war kind of thing that happens? <laughs> Big war happens. Reference Man- in Mandalorian. Reference in the Mandalorian. Mandalore is like blown up or something. Big, yeah. Big hole in the planet, essentially. Mm-hmm. And that is eventually what leads to Mando and his small crew. Right. But here's here's what I'm getting at with this. The first introduction we get to Mandalore in this episode, they're like flying into like a bubble. Yeah. What's up with that? Honestly, I kind of looked at it at the way Coruscant exists because I, I my intru- my first impression was that it was a high society, uh, a lot cleaner than I expected. Well, the whole thing is that they had fought each other in the past for years and like destroyed their planet so mm-hmm. they could only live in these like bubbles, right? I guess is that the is that the backstory? Did I just make that up? I don't know. <laughs> were Someone... they bubbles or were they domes? It looked like you know, dome-shaped buildings. All right, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Dome-shaped buildings. That's what I mean. Okay, well, so, yeah, like, from referencing back to when I started the episode, it looked like kind of like the Senate building to me. Mm-hmm. That's the immediate thing that I compared it to. So seeing Mandalore exist with architecture this grand, I think is what caught me off guard. Because I kind of thought that the Mandalorian people were going to be like nomadic almost, you know. Oh, I didn't think that at all. Okay, well, you had more knowledge of yeah. them before I did, because <laughs> like my only experience with the Mandalorian are Mando, Jango Fett, who doesn't even count, it's not Mandalorian. Boba Fett, who also doesn't count and sucks. <laughs> and so we'll I, get was, to that. I was, <laughs> yeah, we will. I was just surprised to see Mandalorian people walking around without the helmets on. Yeah, I mean, they just look like regular people. Well, I know they're regular people. <laughs> I've seen on past Mandalorians before. Yeah, yeah. But I was surprised that, like, not everybody had a helmet on. Well, I think they they must have taken up different sects of Mandalorians after the Purge. So is it like the warriors maybe follow that? Maybe it's just something that different sects of Mandalorians after the Purge. Mm-hmm. Like, like some some of them like kind of take their religion to the extreme, and that's what we see in the Mandalorian. Yeah, so we because we do see the um, dumb name, dumb name. What's the name? I have no idea. Dumb, dumb name of that group. Death Squad oh, or something. The Death, Death March, Death Strike, Death something Watch. Like that. Death Watch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Death Watch. Uh, they're all warrior Mandalorian, and they're all wearing their helmets. Right. So maybe it is a warrior thing. Not true though, because we see. Governor Sar Vizsla take off his helmet and he's right. So I'm saying it's not people swearing they wouldn't take him off. I'm just saying like oh, they, they just do it. They're the ones you'd most often find wearing that helmet. Right. You know. Okay. Like Satine isn't gonna be walking around with a Mandalorian mask on. I expected the person in charge would be. Right. But fair enough. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way. Mm-hmm. So it was cool seeing their culture fleshed out. Yeah, I think I think you know that. In in the Star Wars lore, they've been around for a really long time. Yeah, and so it would make sense that they have that kind of backstory. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I love this arc. I like this arc too. Honestly, it's hard for me to like differentiate exactly like which which episode is which. Yeah, and I think that's fine because the rate we were going the past few episodes have just been watching the arcs, not the individual episodes. Yeah, I kind of just, like, watched it all at once and forgot which what happens in which episode. Yeah, because if I know that we were watching two arcs in a week, I will dedicate a night to each arc. Yeah. and You don't want to split it up. No, because I think that binging it, I think, in this way, works great, and I think that's why at least I've been so positive on it is because seeing the three chapters of just, like, a three-arc short film... Or, like, a full episode of, like, a premium TV show makes the storytelling work even better for me. Yeah. Um, what did you... Did you like about... Uh, did you like all the politics in this arc? I did. Me too. Okay. I think it's one of... It's a very good example of making Star Wars politics interesting. For sure, yeah. And I, I loved it, too, because it was, again, through the perspective of like the jedi lens and i think that's when politics can be the most accessible in star wars 
because you see Obi-Wan who is following the code of the Jedi. We all know what the code is, you know, of like, you're a priest. <laughs> Essentially. Um, He's still like abstinent and like... Well, technically not. You just can't have attachments. That's confirmed. Is that true? That is 100% true as far as I know. All right. Well, because Obi Wan knew you, you're telling me, <laughs> <laughs> Obi Wan, the master of Anakin, who knows this kid, did not know he was sleeping with Padme. Oh no, he knew. Yeah, so he's like, he's like monitoring, like he's like, hey, do your thing, man. But like, second you like wa- be like, want cuddle? No, that's yeah. not how it works. <laughs> you can't get emotional here. That's fo- that's so funny. I can just imagine Obi Wan being like. You can hang out with her, but you can't <laughs> cuddle afterwards. <laughs> like, that's the whole thing. It's like they can have attachments, you know? It's just... Well, they can't. Well, okay. Well, they can have relations. They just can't have attachments and, like, physical... Well, they can have physical attachments, but they can't be like, <laughs> oh, if I lose her or if I lose him or if I lose R2 in this thing, I'm just going to have a breakdown. That's where they get iffy. Yeah. And I think um, this is a good segue into uh, Obi-Wan. My favorite Star Wars character. Your he just shines through in this arc. He does shine through in this arc. And I think it also expands on his character in a very interesting way. Mm-hmm. Speaking of attachment and uh, uh, love. Yeah. Interest. Mm-hmm. Satine. Definitely. Thoughts. Uh, I liked it. It felt natural for the character, even though I could definitely see where people would come in and be like, the Obi-Wan we know, the Obi-Wan in A New Hope, would never stray this far away from the Jedi Code. But I think the way it's presented and the fact that it was remnants of his life as a Padawan, where he could have dipped out if he wanted to, I think that's an interesting way to like introduce that. And I think that also adds an interesting layer to his relationship with Anakin, which I really like. Are you a fan of this relationship? Oh, yeah. No, okay. Totally. I, I thought you were going somewhere. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I just, I like it. it. It worked in my head. It felt natural. Again, he's my favorite Star Wars character. So, like, if it was out of character, I'd probably be upset about it. But I thought it worked well. I thought it worked almost, like, seamlessly. Yeah. Like, it's very cool to see Obi-Wan. Like, like Obi-Wan as a character is very much fleshed out. In, in the prequels and also in the original trilogy. Mm-hmm. But this just, like, adds so much depth to him. For sure. Because um, he never really had any, like, points of contention. That's what I'm saying. Like, not saying that he wasn't before, but it humanizes him. Yeah, because even with the original trilogy and, like, how he, like, dictates what Luke is supposed to do, he's still pretty much, like... Black and white. Yeah. And this is, like, adding some interesting color in here. Yeah, well, I mean, it shows that he, like, low-key struggled with... I think he still does. Like, I think there's moments in this arc where it shows him, like, reminiscing on that and feeling an attachment, you know? It's not just, like, him being like, oh, yeah, those are the days, eh? It's like, oh, no, I'm genuinely still concerned with your well-being, and if only... (laughs) I mean, it it also kind of, like, plays into the whole... Like, we know where the Jedi end up. Yeah. It's no secret. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of it had to do with their hubris, right? They couldn't see past their own teachings mm-hmm. to the true enemy. And, like, it's it's interesting because in this arc, Obi-Wan starts to sort of struggle with that. But, like, he never, like, thinks about it. He never, like, steps back and takes, like, a bigger picture thought about it, which mm-hmm. kind of makes, which kind of, like, adds to the whole, like, he didn't see the Sith coming. Yeah. That's just like a small part of this overall larger hubris of the Jedi Order. Yeah, and I think Satine saw that. Like, she kind of called him out a few times on things like that, of like not being able to see the full picture, being hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Uh, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil, <laughs> almost. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, he, he's like... Like these struggles are like manifesting itself in, in like this in this really like visceral way for Obi Wan, but he doesn't take that step back and being like, "Why am I feeling these ways? Mm-hmm. Is that a is that a problem? Like, is this clouding like our overall judgment, our our just like blind recognition, like 
blind allegiance to these just like dogmatic views. Mm -hmm. He doesn't ever take that step back, which is interesting. It is interesting. I don't know if he does in the future, but yeah, like I'm sure we're going to revisit Satine at some point since they set her up and spent so much time on her and his relationship. But I really enjoyed again, all of that stuff a ton. Also, before we move on from like the middle arc, the middle of this arc, did you recognize who that general was, the Mandalorian of Death Watch? Wait, no. The voice actor. No. Get this, John Favreau. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, it's the governor, right? Yeah. Sar Fisla. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't recognize that in the moment. Yeah, because when he got introduced and he said his, like his first few lines, I was like, "That's not John Favreau, right?" And then. <laughs> I was like listening to it more and I was like, I think that's John Favreau. And then I clicked on the box because they always hide the credits at like two seconds after they start. It's John Favreau. You know, it, uh, that's, I was watching it and I was like, it sounds like the heavy gunner from, from yeah. Mandalorian yeah. episode three, mm-hmm. but not actually. Um, before we move on from, from the middle of this arc, mm-hmm. I believe this happens in the second episode. I, w- I was about to dive into second episode stuff. Okay. Um, Never mind. And I, I think I might know what you're going to get at because I do have something written down that I loved. I, I, I'm not, I, I can't even see what you're okay. writing down, but yeah. So the second episode is the Voyage of Temptation that deals more with the actual transporting of Satine to the Senate to be like, hey, we don't want no part of your war. Mm-hmm. It's interesting what we just talked about with Obi-Wan and Satine, then bringing Anakin into the mix. Because just, like, seeing that dynamic between them and seeing, like, Obi-Wan specifically in the elevator and, like, seeing him just feel, like, judged by Anakin for all of this after, like, falling strictly with it, always condemning Anakin for, like, straying from the Jedi path and then Anakin, like, realizing the hypocrisy of it, I liked that a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I think it, man, it just, like, really just, like, laying the seeds for, like what comes next yes 100 (laughs) percent um the entire cruise ship part or not cruise ship but like the the entire arc on the ship how you feel about that i think this is the weakest episode okay out of the three Mm -hmm. just because like didn't feel like much happened like yeah they mostly spent most they spent most of their time just fighting all these bad guys on the ship right Mm mm-hmm the the biggest thing for me with this episode and the reason I I actually labeled this one great and the other two are good. I oh, okay. think so you think opposite. I think it's because of the way it fleshes out Anakin and Obi-Wan. Because it does it subtly, but just like seeing how they play in this scenario together and like just see Anakin slowly realizing things about his master. Um also Obi Wan talking about his backstory as a Padawan with Qui Gon liked that moment yeah um but yeah i enjoyed seeing them work together it made me feel more of like the oh you're my brother more than just what we've seen so far of like oh they're buddies you know this one felt more of like a hey i trust you with this yeah yeah be cool i have to say i i honestly wasn't as impressed with this episode but Mm -hmm. i do see where you're coming from it was interesting to watch that dichotomy on that ship Mm -hmm. but yeah as far as what they were doing it's fine. It's kind of boring. Yeah. It was like the classic, like, one of your most trusted confidants is actually out to betray you. And it's like, oh. And it's like, this is, uh, I've seen this a thousand times. There's one thing in this episode, though, that I think was my favorite moment of, of this entire arc. I don't know if this is the same thing. Okay. So, the big climax of the episode, right? So, Teen gets kidnapped. She's being held hostage by the person who betrayed her. All we want is hunting her down. Oh, okay. I know. Joker style. This guy is like, oh, which one is going to break your rule? <laughs> Are you going to, Obi Wan, or is he going to like be the, the killer Satine thinks he is, or is Satine going to be a hypocrite? Which one of you is going to be the first one to be a stone cold killer? Lightsaber through the chest. Anakin shows up. Imperial March plays. Loved it because they don't lean into that too much, no. but it worked. I didn't notice that the Imperial March played. Yeah, it was like the slow, it was like, dun, dun, dun. it was like really drawn out, but it was there. Okay. I thought she was going to do it. I did too. <laughs> I really but did. 
There was a moment, like, once he said, like, killer or something, I was like, oh, Anakin's going to show up. And then the lightsaber happened. I was like, ah. Straight through the chest. Loved that moment. So that's not actually the moment that I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. But it happens in the same scene. Okay. Um, It has to do with Satine and Obi-Wan. And Satine is taken hostage by this guy. And Obi-Wan finally, like, catches up to them. On the bridge? Yeah, in, like, the hallway or whatever. Um, And she says that she loves him oh yeah she says she says i love you right and then he says he doesn't say it back yeah which is classic yeah but instead he says like had you said the word i would have left the order yeah and i was like whoa (laughs) that's serious that's some serious stuff right there i think that happened seconds before anakin merged with this man (laughs) right but i think that i guess i was just still reeling from that moment yeah for sure yeah didn't notice the imperial march <laughs> it's funny that <laughs> within 40 seconds we had both had significantly different takeaways from that encounter i just really liked that i did too yeah it was cool and i liked seeing sort of the culmination of everything that we talked about with obi-wan as a teen so far mm-hmm. so i did like that moment a lot uh, yeah it was very good and uh, I, I'm cu- I'm curious how much we dive into qui-gon in the future i know there's at least one episode that qui-gon plays a big role of Clone Wars. Okay. I wonder if it's on our watch list. Maybe. I hope it is, Jack. But <laughs> it's it's n- interesting I bring that up because, like, you see sort of the influence of Qui-Gon on Obi-Wan in that moment. Because Qui-Gon, similar to Anakin, was kind of like, I'm going to do my own thing. <laughs> I'll be cool, but, like, I'm doing it my way. Yeah, yeah. So. I like that. It reminds me of that, that book that came out, Master and Apprentice. Was that is that new canon? That's new can, yeah. I might read that. I heard it's good. I think Claudia Gray wrote it. Okay, I'll definitely I read think. that then. Yeah, I don't know. I'll check. But anyway, yeah, that 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 has to do with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan while Obi-Wan was a Padawan still, which is, like, super cool, I think. It is Claudia Gray. Nice. Six bucks on Amazon. Wait, really? Yeah. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, six bucks on Amazon. Master and Apprentice, Claudia Gray. Dude, I'm buying that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, free on Audible. I don't. I don't. I don't do audio books, but <laughs> well, if you want, uh, <laughs> we're actually sponsored by audio, Audible. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, but the the conclusion of this arc, did you? So you liked the the final episode more than the second one? I liked the final episode more than the second one. This one definitely gets more in the weeds of the politics, like you were saying. Yeah, and I like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I liked seeing Palpatine's frustration, because I like when it doesn't go his way. Yeah. Because it's cool seeing how he handles it. And I really liked the moment at the end when they're all in his office. And he's like, oh, my sincerest apologies from the Republic. When in his head, he's probably like cussing her out. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, oh, my God. Well, she's, she like appears from nowhere, too. She kind of like. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. One thing we didn't talk about, I don't mean to go back so far. We didn't talk about the Darksaber at all. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. But it, it appeared. So is that the same one? That yeah. Gideon has? Yeah. Oh, so there's only one. There's only one. Oh. Interesting. And, like, from what I understand, back, back, way back in the, in the past in this lore, the, the Mandalorian who had the Darksaber basically, like, was the leader of the Mandalorian. That's cool. Because, the, yeah, the uh, John Favreau's character did say, like, oh, my ancestors had it. Yeah, when they fought the war against the Jedi. Mm -hmm. That's cool, though. I'm into it. I also like the noises that it makes when it clashes against the lightsaber. Yeah. It's like... Yeah. (laughs) It's a neat little thing in the lore. Yeah. I hope to see more of it soon, and I'm sure we will in season Um, two. We saw it it in uh, Mandalorian. I was just going to say something super off track, but like... Yeah, we're just just bouncing back and forth. Yeah, because, I mean, I don't think we're going to have a great discussion about the next arc. I don't think so either. So I do want to ask you this question I just thought of. Yeah. Do you think, getting wild here, do you think Mando is going to wield a lightsaber at some point to fight Gideon? No. Or is he just going to blast him? He's just going to blast him. Okay. He's going to find a way. I, f- I feel like he might find a way to like disarm him and then take the dark saber on his own. Oh, season three, he's walking around with a dark saber? Yeah, something like that. I don't think he's going to like find a lightsaber. Find a lightsaber right? off a dead body and just be like, uh. Also, I feel like that'd be really hard. <laughs> at that point in time sure um so yeah 
the the final episode of that arc, I think I thought it wrapped things up nicely. It left off on an interesting point with Obi Wan and Satine sort of disagreeing, but like coming together still as friends, you know. Yeah, it just like also has a tinge of sadness in it. Yeah, but um, I just like I really enjoy the whole. I, I just thought the politics in this arc was like, were like super complex for a kids show. Yeah, um, the whole you know if the republic comes, then the people are gonna rise up. The people are gonna rise up against us, mm-hmm. and I think that that was very cool for them to explore that. Yeah, and then also for them to explore the republic is this body that thinks that they're just like doing good in the universe. Yeah, and that they're I think Palpatine says like we're we're trying to save you. Mm-hmm. We're trying to save your people. Yeah, but like. It's all from a certain point of view. For sure. And it was, it was, I really liked Satine's role in all of this because it made that more evident than ever, I think. Yeah, because she's so staunchly against it. Yeah, so you see, like, because, like, what she's saying makes sense. Definitely. Like, I, when she was talking, I was like, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> for sure. So, like, seeing Obi-Wan be like, no, though. <laughs> I was like, Obi-Wan... <laughs> Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, that's that goes back to my. No, like, yeah, I thought it like. Point. Yeah, I thought it like portrayed all of that really well. Yeah, I really, I really, really enjoyed this arc. Me too. Next one. Not so much. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> the second, the exact second, I put up that first uh, death trap two twenty. Um, the second I saw that thumbnail with, I knew who it was. I knew it was Boba Fett <laughs> as a kid. I was like, oh god, what is this arc gonna be? Dad. Tom Wee's here. <laughs> so the first episode, um, my review is eh, E-H. <laughs> I honestly f- forget what happens. So it was it was Boba Fett as a kid sneaking on with the other kid cadets because apparently those exist. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Yeah, he tries to blow up Mace Windu and like... Yeah, and I, from that perspective, I'll give them that. That's an interesting thing to explore of Boba Fett getting his feet wet in the bounty hunting business and being like, I want revenge on the guy that killed my dad. That's interesting, but this arc doesn't do anything cool with it, I don't think. No, it doesn't. It introduces Aura Singh. Though. Yeah, so when they said the name finally, I was like, oh, that calling back to like episode three of this show. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, you were like, oh, keep an eye out for Aura Singh. She comes up a couple times. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, she, there she is, Aura Singh. Yeah. And I was like, like, when I saw her, I was like, oh, I know who that is. But I, it never made the connection. She's like in Phantom Menace. Yeah. Briefly. Mm-hmm. Like, I was always familiar with that character design. Yeah. Like, I could recognize her in a crowd. Right. But, like, I didn't know she had a name. I mean, I think she's in, like, the visual dictionaries and That's stuff. probably why. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, there's the death track. Do you know the reasoning behind having kid clones to train? Well, I don't... F- I think, like, that's just how... That's just how the clones evolve, you know? It's not, though. Is it not? No, they're taken out of those tubes when they're, like, Jenga Fett clones. Is that true? I didn't know that. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Because either in Attack of the Clones or in, like, Clone Cadets or something, or Rookies, I'm pretty sure they're talking about, like, it's the 10-year cycle of growing the clones, accelerated, and they come out as... Men. Yeah, they they look like Jenga Fett did. Okay. And then, because Jenga specifically said, give me one... That's like a kid, so I can raise him as my kid. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that Boba Fett was like like the prime clone, you know, and every other <laughs> sure. clone was kind of like... <laughs> I mean, clearly not, because some of these clones did way more than he's ever done. <laughs> Very, That's a huge burn on Boba Fett's part. <laughs> you really turned me around on Boba Fett of not liking him. Well, I don't like Boba Fett. I think he's dumb. He doesn't do anything. Yeah, like, I always thought he was fine. I have a shirt with Boba Fett on it, but the second you said he's dumb, I was, like, I can't unsee that. I'm like, yeah, he doesn't do anything. He literally doesn't do anything. Yeah. And, like, this episode, really this arc, he just, like, tries to do stuff and doesn't really work. Yeah, and I mean, I'll give him the fact that it's, like, it's a kid learning how to be a bounty hunter. So, like, I don't think he's going to do well. But at this point, I don't think I'm interested in seeing Boba Fett be a character anymore. <laughs> I don't think we're going to see him that much. Yeah, like there's that new Bounty Hunters comic coming up that I'm definitely going to read. Uh, but I don't really have an interest in Boba Fett as like fleshing him out anymore as an adult. I, always, I just don't think that he 
is a character that really should be fleshed out. Yeah. Like, he is, after all, like, literally a clone. Yeah. Of Jango Fett. Mm -hmm. In some way, like, that kind of... That kind of, like, lack of personality, I guess. Like, lack of individuality. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this, to be honest. Well, I can see, like, where you're coming from of, like, in relation to why people do like Boba Fett. Because originally he wasn't that he was just what we see mando as now of like it's a cool guy you know? cool guy with a gun he's got a cool mask you know yeah. so the people that like, grew up knowing him as that forever right sure but now <laughs> yeah i would say jango fett's cooler than boba fett he's at least done more <laughs> yeah jango fett is, has done way more i love how i love <laughs> i love how mace windu essentially in this episode was like yeah i don't know he watched me like <laughs> kill uh, his dad he, or he watched me cut off his dad's head don't know why he's that having such a problem about it. Yeah, I don't know why he can't just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mace is great. I really like Mace in this episode because you get more of like sort of what's hinted at in his little time on screen in the films, but like just seeing how he is like very unique on the council of like, yeah, he follows the, he sits on the council, but he is kind of like, following his own thing yeah 100 percent, yeah so that was neat and it was cool seeing him with anakin too because they we know they have that tension in the movies so those were for sure my highlights though yeah i i would just, i would agree i i wasn't as fan of, as, as much of a fan of the second arc as i was yeah i wasn't either i thought uh the episode r2 come home which was the middle episode in this arc was the better one of the three because you saw more of the Anakin and Mace back and forth. And it was also turned into like some like kids movie Disney adventure of like, oh, the the dog has to go save the owner because it was R2 traveling to Ahsoka and Plo Koon and being like, they're stuck, help them. <laughs> oh, wait, I think I, all right. So Christian and I were talking before we filmed this. Mm-hmm. Um, I fell asleep watching the second, the, the third, third episode, episode because I remember this episode. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was just silly. Yeah. So uh, that was a little, like, refreshing after the entire Mandalore arc of just seeing, like, some silly-looking thing. Um, but, yeah, this is definitely one of the weaker ones so far, I think. Uh, oh, sorry. Another big takeaway. Got to see Bosk. <laughs> For, like, thank, a second. Thank God. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> More Bosk, please. Uh, He's like a random playable character in, in Battlefront. Battlefront yeah, yeah, for some reason. So is um. Oh, I don't know his name. Um, it's some other bounty hunter. There's like two of them in there. There's Den- Bosk and uh, then Dengar. Dengar. Yeah. I think Dengar's in there yeah. for some reason. Uh, but that wraps this week's Clone Wars watch along. Yeah. What do we got next week? Next week, we have another six episode. Yeah, there's two arcs to cover. Well, there's like three standalone episodes, and then there's an arc. So we got season three, episode two, Arc Troopers. Shout out to Cara Dune. Uh, season one, episode 22, Hostage Crisis. Season three, episode 10, Heroes on Both Sides. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> season three, episode 12, 13 and 14, Night Sisters, Monster, and Witches of the Mist. This is a Dothamir act. Yeah. Arc. I'm excited. Yeah. Because we're going to get into it. Dothamir. Especially after Fallen Order. Love it. It's going to be cool. So yeah, that wraps this week for Star Wars. Uh, like we said before the show, before the halftime break. <laughs> I wish I had a whistle. <laughs> halftime. Um, season 7 of Clone Wars starts after this episode comes out. So if you're watching along with that, uh, I don't think we're covering it as they come out. I, yeah, no. But we will eventually once we reach that point. I think we're getting there. We are. Yeah, we're, we're making it. We're in season three now. I, honestly, I'd rather just wait. I'm fine waiting too. Just wait until we get there. Yeah, I'm. It's gonna be hard to dodge spoilers. I don't know how hard I'll try, but like, I'm not gonna try that hard, to be honest with you. Yeah, I Do mean, you, I'm not gonna actively seek it out. Mm-hmm. But like, if it comes up, yeah, I'm not gonna be that mad about it. Yeah, because I've been reading some things. Yeah, <laughs> very vague things and. Uh, we might see some of the events of episode three retold in this season from a slightly different perspective. Well, I thought that was almost already confirmed. Yeah. But, like, 
a specific order. Maybe close to 69. Oh, oh 68? Yeah. <laughs> order 68? Yeah. <laughs> I want to know what the other orders were. Yeah. Well, we know what the first order was. True. And the final order. That's very true. Order 65, that's... Um, when that's did it stop? What is What number is the final order? 70. What is 65, though? Uh, order 65... That's um, that's Sheev's favorite. Um, that's Sheev's favorite burger at at McDonald's. There you go. That's what he asks the Praetorian guards when he's hungry. He says, "Get me an order 65." So what's order number nine then? Because that's the Big Mac, right? Mambo number. Nine. <laughs> Mambo number nine. Mando number nine. <laughs> All right. Mike, where can the people find you if they want to find your hijinks? Yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can. Or not at Mike P. Connors. Very nice. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Chris N. Buckley. That's the same as my Instagram. If you're listening to the show, you're listening to it on a podcast service like Apple Podcasts, where you can give us a rate, a review. Helps us find new listeners, other Star Wars fans. Spotify still doesn't let us do that, but we're on Spotify. Um, so we're really on everything. Yeah. <laughs> we're on YouTube. Yes. We're in your home. Yeah. And your Alexis. If you're listening to this with headphones on, we're in your ears. Yeah. We've infiltrated. We have. Total saturation. Total saturation. But that's going to do it for this week. I think I plugged everything. And until next time, yeah, I don't know. we're fine. Everything's fine. How are you? May the force be with you. General Kenobi. <laughs>